Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Vlog. And today we're actually gonna break down another comic book. We're gonna talk about the Vengeance of Venom trade paperback. So in our one of our previous episodes, actually, we talked about the birth of Venom trade paperback. And that was basically looking at the first stories of Venom and the black suit and how it uh, you know, appeared in the Marvel Universe with Spider-Man and the Secret Wars. And we talked about that and I'll try to put a link to that down below if you wanna watch that before you get into this one. And this is basically the follow-up to that. So these are the adventures that took place in the Amazing Spider-Man book and some of the annuals that came out afterwards um, that kind of document the further adventures of Spider-Man versus Venom. Because remember, when this guy hit the ground, Fans reacted. They loved him. Todd McFarlane's art, you know, like really sold it. Everyone was really into it. David Michelini wrote a killer script and everyone was like, all right, I like this character. He's vicious, he's mean, and he's a, a great anti-Spider-Man. He's a He has all of his strengths and pretty much none of his weaknesses. He has different weaknesses, uh, but it's something very specific that Spider-Man has to basically put a human being in harm's way in order to hurt the symbiote with sonic sounds or fire, you know, laser beams, things like that. So it's, it's, not really Spider-Man's wheelhouse of way of fighting. Uh, it's kind of like like down and dirty kind of. So uh, people really reacted to that and liked it and liked the appearances of Venom in his uh, in issue 300 and then I think in like issue 315, 316, 317, like around that time. So in this book, it basically has like Amazing Spider-Man 330 and I think 31 and then jumps to like 340 something and then 360, one and two and three, which is uh, basically the first appearance of Carnage which we're not gonna talk about on this episode because we're gonna do a whole episode on Carnage based on the graphic novel called Carnage Classic. And in that, it'll have his first appearance. It'll have like a bunch of other appearances with him. I think he, when he bonded with Silver Surfer, like we'll talk about all that in another episode. But this episode, we're just gonna focus on the Venom stories that are inside the Vengeance of Venom trade paperback. At the beginning of this book, it's actually throws you right in the middle of a couple stories because obviously a lot of issues are missing between the last trade paperback and this one regarding Peter Parker's you know, everyday life uh, because Mary Jane's like going through this really horrible experience where she was, you know, acting and, and that's not the horrible part, but she was acting and she ended up meeting like this, you know, casting agent guy who was willing to give her a bunch of work and it turned out he was a real creep. And uh, so that very relatable to the stuff that's going on in the news uh, nowadays. And she's basically being harassed by this guy. And I think it, they even mentioned, cause I don't remember this like era, like the early 300s uh, to 330 of Spider-Man. Some of that stuff is a blank to me because I wasn't really allowed to buy Spider-Man at that point. Because when I jumped into reading Spider-Man, it was at Fearful Symmetry, uh, which is also known as Craven's Last Hunt. And that book ended with a suicide. And when my mom saw that, she was like, you can't read Spider-Man. And I didn't come back in until Carnage first appeared. And when I went to buy back issues of the stuff I missed, I pretty much only got stuff with Hobgoblin, if he ever appeared, and Venom. Uh, so I missed out on some of this storyline. So basically Mary Jane is being harassed by this guy, and it looked like he might have even captured her or kidnapped her at one point and just thoroughly harassed her and, and made her really uncomfortable. And so she's in a position in this storyline where she's like, you know, contemplating legal action and she could, you know, get a lot of money if, if they win the case because this guy has money and it could change her and Peter's life. But she ends up not doing the lawsuit because she's afraid of the guy and she just doesn't even want to be in the same room with him if they go to court. And she's like, he'll, he'll leer at me, Peter. He'll stare at me. And I don't, I don't even want his eyes on me. I just want, I want us to move on with our lives and I don't want to, you know, pursue this. I just want, I just want us to move on. And so she's dealing with that. That's like the emotional state she's in. And Peter's also going through a lot too. And he's, and he's having trouble sharing stuff with Mary Jane because he knows she's going through this tough time. So he's just trying to be supportive of her. And it's, so it's a really interesting time for Peter's life. And then meanwhile, uh, the creepy guy that was, you know, after Mary Jane, he's hired these two guys named Sticks and Stone to try to kill Spider-Man. And they are like the worst villains ever. Like, uh, I don't even want to talk about their powers um, because they're so lame and, and terrible. And they really have nothing to do with Sticks or Stones. Uh, they, or they don't really name call either. They're just like these two random thugs with weird powers. So Spider-Man's dealing with them. And in the midst of all this, Venom shows back up in his life. So it's pretty much just typical Peter Parker. When he starts to get at his lowest, something, you know, even more evil it piles on top, you know? And it's just, that's the constant struggle of Peter Parker is that he's an everyman and things always seem to be bad for him. And uh, and even when he gets a ray of sunshine, he embraces that and then it's right back to the bad stuff for the most part. With Venom's return, he basically is just once again tormenting Peter. He, you see him, you know, Venom's Eddie Brock's working out, he's getting ready. Every time he works out, 
he gets stronger. The stronger he gets, the more the symbiote can enhance him. So it's a really interesting relationship that these two are developing. And you start to see throughout this trade paperback the kind of the, the growth of these two, this alien and this human growing together uh, for better or worse. You start to see them evolve in the story because the book actually opens with Eddie breaking out of the vault. Like he, he pretends to be dead and the suit encases him because the suit can like look like clothes. It can look like anything of any color. It can change, you know, camouflage itself and just fit right in. So it created an Eddie Brock like skin, almost like a snake would shed its skin. It put like, it created like an Eddie Brock skin and then uh, cut, you know, Eddie Brock off from, uh, you know, connecting to it. So he, Eddie Brock is like asleep peacefully with a breathing apparatus created by the suit. So you start learning all these new sinister creative powers that the suit can actually do. And, uh, and Eddie Brock is asleep and he's safe, but on the outside, you know, all the guards think Eddie Brock has died. They can't read his pulse. They can't do anything. And it's because the suit created like a dead shell around him uh, of skin, of excess skin. Cause whenever it shoots its webbing out, that's like excess skin for it. So it can dispose of it. And that's how, kind of how it does it. It uses it to like bring Eddie swinging him through the city, like Spider-Man to get him to his next destination. And, uh, and then it just purges the skin and the, the skin shrivels up and dies. So that's kind of what's going on here. It encases him in that. So they bring him in the autopsy room and they're like, oh my God, what did he die of? And they go to cut him and the suit awakens and frees Eddie Brock and the two of them escape. So again, just showing you, you cannot keep this guy down. Like he, you could, you could lock him in a room. You could put lasers on him. You could do whatever. He will find a way out. And the him and the suit are, they start, they're really devious and they, they really are cunning and can think of really interesting ways to escape things. Uh, they're just monsters uh, pretty much. And they will use any tactic, lying, whatever, to get, you know, play possum to get out. And, uh, and that's what sets up this storyline. So right at the beginning, you know, in this trade paperback, okay, Venom's loose. What's going to happen? And then Peter learns about that. He goes talk to Fantastic Four. He's battling sticks and stone. He's got all this stuff. Mary Jane's going through her things. Uh, and then uh, it all culminates in this big battle. Eventually, like at like 10, 15, 20 issues later, where it's like, it starts an issue like 330 of Amazing Spider-Man and ends like in, you know, 340. And it's not that whole run. It's only like two issues here. And then it skips like 10 issues and then, you know, goes into these two issues. And basically this all culminates with Venom getting Spider-Man onto an island and beating him within one inch of his life. And Peter is just down and out. He is not, he cannot physically beat Venom. And he, even in this environment, they're in the sand, there's like trees, like he can't really web away, get away from him. Venom destroys like his, you know, web shooters. He's just beating the crap out of Peter and basically brings him to the point of death. Peter was able to slip away during this fight and he goes and finds like on this island, there's like a dead, you know, he found like some dead bodies, uh, just like the skeletons, the remains of them. Cause I guess they did some testing there or something like that years ago. And it was a place that Venom knew of, knew it would be isolated. So Spider-Man grabs one of those bones and puts parts of his costume on it and then sets off a bomb. And uh, so he's like, hey, hey Venom, I'm gonna blow you up. Come over here to the fire. And then he sets the bomb off prematurely, uh, purposefully, and then escapes naked swimming through the ocean towards a boat he sees out in the distance. And meanwhile, Venom comes across the bones uh, of the remains that Peter Parker found and sees scraps of the Spider-Man costume on him and believes Spider-Man to be dead. So then at that point, Venom's like, okay, he's dead. I guess I'll just chill out here on this island and just, uh, you know, savor my victory. And that's kind of how Spider-Man, in a way, gets rid of Venom temporarily. And then, of course, they have a rematch and then Venom gets captured. And once again, Venom escapes again. He's, he's actually this time separated from the costume and he's in a cell with Cletus Cassidy. And uh, he gets broken out by the symbiote once again. The symbiote was believed to be dead uh, after the second encounter of Spider-Man and Venom have in this book and they get separated. And Eddie Brock is just all alone. He's in his cell and he's paying for the crimes that he's done. And he's with, he's roomed with a serial killer named Cletus Cassidy. And Cletus actually is contemplating killing Venom until the suit shows up and saves Venom. But then it also has, uh, it reproduces. Looks like the suit, the reason why it was gone for some time, it was wounded, but it was also reproducing. Uh, I guess the symbiotes reproduce asexually and just kind of split. And that's what happened. And that is what creates Carnage, which we'll talk about in another episode. So after the Carnage storyline, Venom is actually once again captured. He's locked up with his suit. And what happens is Matt Murdock, Daredevil himself, actually wants to come and defend Eddie Brock and, and plead the insanity case. And he wants to defend him and basically say like, look, this guy, he's warped, he's, he's psychotic. And then he got, you know, bonded with an alien symbiote from another world that we have not fully studied and don't fully know. And 
it could have driven him, you know, driven him even more insane. And so I want to defend this guy in court, and I want to give him a second chance. And I, Spider-Man, I need you to testify. So there's like this little one-shot storyline called Venom on Trial, and basically Spider-Man's like, I don't want to testify. This guy's a bad guy. He's tormented my aunt, which he does in this book. He comes, you know, comes and visits Aunt May again, visits Mary Jane. It's like all these like really creepy moments. This time he's leaning back on the creepiness though, and he's like, Look, I'm not here to hurt them, Peter. I'm here to hurt you. And I'm not going to hurt them to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you to save them. Like, that's how warped he is. He's just like, look, everyone in Peter Parker's life, they're in trouble. Peter only hurts the people he loves by being Spider-Man. And I'm going to save them from Spider-Man. And that was his mentality that he started to develop. And Peter's like, look, Daredevil, I don't trust this guy. He's nuts. And, and Daredevil's like, yes, I know he's crazy. And I want to help him. And so I need your help to help him. So Spider-Man starts to buy into this. Okay, maybe Eddie's reformed. You see the symbiote is dead. Uh, actually, Eddie's in his cell and he's crying and he's and he's like, You're like, please help me, help me. I didn't want to do all this stuff. It made me do it. And you see the symbiote just laying there, you know, lifeless. And they pick up the symbiote, they study it, and they're like, yeah, it's dead. It's not moving. Uh, what we find out though, as the story progresses, is Eddie Brock, who's playing innocent, and playing victim, and he's on the stand and he's like saying, I didn't mean to do this stuff. I hated Spider-Man, but I really just went to that church to kill myself. I'm not a threat to anyone. I was just a threat to myself. So, you know, please give me a second chance to be a part of society or get me the help that I need so I can become part of society again. And so Spider-Man starts to be convinced. And he's like, okay, maybe Eddie does deserve a second chance. And then what we learn is that the symbiote once again played possum. It expunged the excess skin that it normally does. It shed itself and it left a piece of itself looking exactly like the symbiote in the cell. And so it was lying inside Eddie and it was keeping his heart rate down. It was controlling his breathing. So that way Daredevil's powers couldn't detect that. Uh, and then also Spider-Man couldn't figure out that he was lying and no lie detector could figure out he was lying. So the symbiote, again, just being very smart, Eddie just proving that he is like a master liar basically um, and can't be trusted in the suit, also feeding him new ways and new ideas to you know deceive people. And so there's this big trial and then Spider-Man outs Venom and Venom turns out, you know, obviously he's not reformed. He's still Venom and he goes nuts and he fights back against Spider-Man and Daredevil. And they, and it was cool to see Daredevil actually fight against uh, Venom. And this was a story written by Peter David. So the rest of the book is mostly David Michelini. This is a one shot done by Peter David, who I, I love. I love his writing big time. I'm loving his Scarlet Spider run he's doing right now. And I love his Spider-Man 2099 stuff that he did recently uh, also. And his Hulk stuff, everything he's ever done, he's been really great at. So seeing Daredevil fight Venom was really cool. You know, it's always cool to see Venom interact with other Marvel characters because Spider-Man's used to the insanity. Other people, it's it's a new bag for them, you know, so it's it's really neat. And at the end, you know, Daredevil, Spider-Man save the day. Venom gets beaten down and uh, and he's once you know, once again captured. Uh, but then he actually gets away again. And the last storyline in this, the, the main last storyline in this is in Amazing Spider-Man 373, 374, and 375. And it was labeled when it came out as the final confrontation between Spider-Man and Venom. And uh, and basically, Peter Parker's parents at this point, because now again we're jumping like 10, 20 uh, issues in the comic book. Um, we have Venom's or v Spider-Man's parents, his actual birth parents, show up, and they or two people that claim to be them show up. And Peter's dealing with now this in his life. Oh my goodness, my parents are back. I'm figuring out who they are. I'm learning about them. I'm connecting with them. Um, this is amazing. You know, there are people that are skeptical that it's really his parents, but he's, you know, trying to be hopeful, trying to believe that maybe something good could finally come in his life. So what ended up happening is Venom finds out about this and decides to go kidnap his parents and bring them to like this carnival. And, uh, and it was like a place that means a lot to Eddie. And that's how Spider-Man finds him because Spider-Man goes in and tracks down Anne Weying, uh, who was formerly known as Anne Brock because she was married to, uh, to Venom. And she decides to help Spider-Man and tell him about, you know, her time with Eddie. So you learn a little bit more about Eddie's life. You learn about their marriage, why it didn't work, um, that he, all, that, that, you know, Venom or Eddie always tried to impress his father, Carl, and it just never, you know, panned out. And Eddie always felt rejected by him. And then after the news came out that he was a fraud journalist, that basically was the final nail in the coffin. And he split and uh, him and Anne, you know, got divorced. So Anne helped Spider-Man track down Venom and Venom once again, and just with Peter Parker's parents saying, look, I'm here to save you. And they're like, oh my God, we're going to die. We're going to die. And he's like, no, I'm not here to kill you. I'm here to save you from Peter Parker, Peter Parker, Spider-Man. And he's going to, he's, you're going to die because of it, because he is just a menace. Everything he touches breaks apart. And so I'm here to save you. And it's weird because like any villain, 
there's a little bit of truth to what he, his like motives are. You kind of are like, you know what? A lot of people have passed away in Peter's life. Uh, and some of it because he was Spider-Man, but some of it because not because he was Spider-Man too. And so it's this very warped look at reality. You know, now that Venom has feed, like fed all of Peter's memories or a lot of Peter's memories to Eddie, Eddie knows uh, Peter Parker and Spider-Man intimately, and he has deduced that Peter is a virus, and and everyone in his life is infected. And so he wants to cut out that infection basically by destroying Peter Parker and Spider-Man. And so in this storyline, that's the culmination is them two fighting in issue 375, and they have this big battle. And then J. Jonah Jameson actually hires Silver Sable in the Wild Pack to get involved because he's like, hey, this is the biggest story of the century. I just did a story where Peter Parker got reunited with his parents and that sold a lot of papers. And now we have a, a potential chance for Spider-Man to be unmasked and then Venom, you know, to be defeated. And I want all this captured and I'm going to hire this, you know, crazy group of, um, of mercenaries called the Wild Pack to get involved and make sure that that is the outcome. So that way we get this storyline uh, for the, for the paper. And so this is during those days where J. Jonah Jameson was like really just a slippery slope like he would he once helped create like scorpion and then he you know got involved with other characters like alistair Smythe, and you know he's done a lot of stuff in the comic books uh but uh, and not a lot of them you know make him out to look like a good person and this is one of those cases where he's like he should have just not got involved and just out of you know craziness or desperation he did so the wild pack gets involved they get their butts kicked but at the same time they also really wound venom so when this crater is falling over, like the scaffolding is falling over, Venom jumps to, to stop it from crushing his ex-wife, Anne, who shows up to like, help the Parkers escape. And then she goes back to save Eddie. And she almost gets crushed. He's holding it up, but he can't do it. The suit is weakening. It's been hit with lasers and fire so many times in a battle that he can't do it. And he's looking at her like, I can't save you. I'm so sorry. And then Spider-Man comes over and helps Eddie. And they work together to push the scaffold off and save Anne. And when that happens... Venom kind of sees, oh, Spider-Man did something good. Like, he's he's not just an infection. He can also do good. And I was blind to that before. And Anne is like, you gotta give him a, you got to give him a second chance, Eddie. You can't just hate him. It's changing who you are. It's, it's you know, you're losing yourself uh, over this hatred. You have to let it go. And you have to see that this guy does try. And that's more than a lot of people do. He's trying to help. And so Venom says, all right, look, Spider-Man, here's the deal. You go that way, I go this way, and we stay away from each other. Don't come after me, don't fight me, and if you do, I'll tear you apart. But So I won't kill you for now, but if you come after me, I definitely will. So Spider-Man's like, um, okay, I guess that's a deal. And then Venom webs off and goes off, you know, to Lethal Protector and his adventures in San Francisco and all that, um, which we talked about in a previous episode. After Venom leaves, basically, Peter goes back home and he's talking to Mary Jane and they're having this heart to heart about all the stuff they've been through over the, these, you know, dozens of issues uh, with Venom and then with Mary Jane's personal life with, the, with that creepy dude. And they're kind of talking it out and are we doing the right thing by letting these bad people walk away and it was really thematically worked i was like wow over like you know 30 issues these threads that kind of come together uh it really just popped for me i was like wow this is a really great ending having this married couple sitting on the couch and just being like we both let two monsters get away with what they've done are we bad people you know and that's kind of the note the book ends on and as we know in lethal protector peter does rise up and want to do something about it and as we've seen in the books uh in between some of these issues where mary jane also is starting to, you know does something about the, the the traumatic event she went through as well so but it was neat it was like a really somber note to end this book on which is you know them deciding if they're good people by allowing these bad people to still roam free i guess and, and that's kind of where the book ends but then right in the tail end there's these annuals that had these short stories in it that kind of fill in the blanks to some of Venom's storylines, and those are tacked on right at the end, and I thought they were fantastic. The last two storylines in this graphic novel are just really short, and they're actually part of the annuals that came out around that time uh, that are written by David Michelini, and they kind of fill in some of the gaps of the origins of Venom. Back in the Birth of Venom trade paperback, which we talked about before, it basically told you the, the cliff note versions. It got right to the story. It was like, all right, Eddie Brock has a suit, and now he hates Spider-Man. But there's actually some time in there uh, that that passed that you are kind of like, what led up to this? You know, if you were wondering what led Eddie on his path, what got him good at, you know, being tactical, 
what got him, you know, wh how did he get well at, you know, outthinking Spider-Man? How did he bond so well with the symbiote? Was there a struggling period? That's kind of what these two storylines are. The first one's called First Kill, and it's basically Eddie Brock building up to the first time he kills somebody who he deems evil. And that's basically the crux of the story, but he's also learning the weaknesses of the costume. So the costume, he's learning about its fire weakness, he's learning about its sonic weakness, you know, things like that. And so that's kind of the, the setup for that one. And it ends with him basically throwing this, this guy who's wronged a lot of people, including Eddie and the, the Globe and stuff, uh, the Daily Globe where Eddie worked. But he's basically, Eddie's doing all this research, piecing together moments of his life that he felt he was wronged. And he's like, you know, building up basically to Spider-Man and to see if he has what it takes to take a life. Because obviously the symbiote hasn't really taken a life yet. It's been attached to Spider-Man and Spider-Man fought it at every instance. So Eddie is slowly giving into it throughout this little short story. And he ends up throwing this guy into like a, you know, a bat of acid or something. It's like very, you know, Joker's Batman-y. But it, it was neat. To, the, the crux of the story was neat because it was like him building up to that. And you're like, okay, now he knows he can take a life. Now he wants to go after Spider-Man. And so what, once that's out of the way, the next storyline, I think it's called Lost Days. And the second story is actually this really interesting one where there are these moments back in Web of Spider-Man, I think 18 and 24 that we talked about in Birth of Venom, where Spider-Man gets pushed out in front of a train. And there's like another instance where he got hit, like, you know, uh, coming off a building and stuff. And he didn't know what happened. He's like, whoa, whatever hit me didn't set off my spider sense. And that was kind of the lead up to Venom. Well, this story is called The Lost Days, and it picks up right after First Kill, and it basically documents those moments through Eddie Brock's point of view. And it was really, really well done, because uh, Ron Lim did some of the artwork, and there was like a couple artists on it, I think, but there was, uh, but David Michelini wrote this really great script where Eddie is, all right, I, like, he's at this point, like, all right, I want to learn the tactics, I want to learn how to catch my enemies by surprise. So there's this homeless guy that Eddie knows, and he goes and talks to him. And he was like a source for Eddie, like when he was a journalist. And uh, and he was a former military man too. But now he's like, you know, homeless. He's strung out on drugs. Eddie goes to him and says, look, I want to help you. I want to give you some money, uh, but I need some help. I, I, I want, to, like, I need tactical information. You were in the military. I need you to focus, you know, push out all the drugs, push out all that stuff. And I need you to help me learn my enemy. How do I fight? How, you know, how do I get in there and get out? You know, I want, I want good strategies. And you're the only person I know that can maybe give me that stuff. So the guy helps Eddie, shows him some, gives him some pointers. Eddie hands him some money and says, look, go get yourself some food. I'll come back in a couple days and I'll let you know about my progress. So then Eddie goes out and, and you see the scenes where he pushes Peter into the subway car uh, to try to kill him. And then Peter, you know, got away barely. And then the moment where he hits Peter off the side of the building. And it's like all this, you know, you see it all from Venom's point of view, from Eddie's point of view. He goes back to talk to the homeless guy. He says, all right, I've done that. Now what's my next step? And when he goes back to see the guy, uh, the guy has overdosed on drugs. He took Eddie's money and just bought a bunch of drugs and killed himself with it. And Eddie, empathetic to that, because Eddie also tried to take his own life right before he met the symbiote, um, kind of immediately felt responsible. He was like, this guy took my money and did this. And, uh, and, I, and now what do I do? And it, it caused Eddie to really look at himself a little bit. And, and, and also the symbiote, I think, was just now understanding like Eddie's light side like there's empathy in eddie you know and uh and so there's like this little interesting moments there but of course they get interrupted because we have to have an action scene uh where eddie is like on the run and he's like fighting people uh and trying to get away and trying not to be spotted by spider-man ever and he's trying to stay in the shadows and that's those are kind of like the last two stories that kind of end this book but i really like them because again they fill in these little interesting gaps and they're stories that you probably wouldn't normally think about you know when that book when issue 300 spider-man came out and Venom told like his whole backstory in like two pages. I was like, all right, that feels kind of rushed. But when I was younger, I was like, oh, this is neat. Like, this is cool. You get his whole backstory and they get right back into the action. But as an adult, obviously I want character. I want layers, you know, peeled back. Uh, every time you peel back, learn more things. And I think that's what David Michelini also did. He was like, all right, we did our action story with Venom and first appearance, but now I want to find out who this guy is. And I want to show him build up to what it was like to kill somebody for the first time. And I want to show, because this is Eddie Brock. He's not a guy who really had murder in his heart. He just hated Spider-Man and wanted bad things to happen to him. But when it came time to do something, he decided to, he wanted to take his own life instead. Everything that was written about Eddie and the journey he goes on in this graphic novel, I thought were really interesting. And I think they add a lot to who this guy is. And I hope it's things that Tom Hardy also peeled when he was like reading up on the character and doing research on the character and maybe something the writers put in the script is that Eddie Brock is actually a, a very deep character in a lot of ways. Like he, on the surface, he's just, oh, he's the brute. He's the anti-Spider-Man. He's this. But when you 
Other stories we're going to get into later were the symbiote, like they, you learn about the symbiote, where it came from, its backstory. You learn more about Eddie Brock and his you know, personal life. Um, there's a great graphic novel I want to touch on called Dark Origin, which we'll talk about in a future episode, which is written by Zeb Wells, and it kind of retells the, a modern day version of Venom's origin, but keeps all the major beats of these storylines in it. And I thought that was very well done. So we'll talk about that. I mean, there's so much to this character that I really love, and I hope that the movie even grazes that because obviously with movies a lot of times they they don't they do not get to the root of what a lot of these characters are and and that's a bummer because i think that's what makes these characters and that's what makes fans of these characters and i know you have to sell to the mass audiences and stuff but if you're making a rated r movie like i thought blade did it really well i thought the crow did it really well these were two movies that were based on source material changed stuff from the source material to fit maybe a slightly broader audience but ultimately knew who their main audience was and who they wanted to target and they executed those movies very well and i just hope that venom the movie kind of follows in that footsteps you know like of the crow and and not that that has to be as good as the crow or blade but just kind of in that ballpark i just want it to go that direction with it and at least get the main stuff of the characters right and to show some level of depth to them that's that's the key here uh but that's just my thoughts you know i want to know what you guys think have you read vengeance of venom have you read this trade paperback uh I, obviously i know i skipped over the carnage storyline like i said we will talk about that we're going to do whole episodes on carnage at some point but i'm waiting till more information comes out about that character and who's going to be playing him so we can do a better comparison because i like thinking about Tom Hardy uh, when I'm when I'm talking about these storylines and inserting him in as Eddie through these storylines because he's such a tremendous actor. I know he can pull off some of these things that have been done in the comics, some of the more dramatic stuff and some of the you know more terrifying stuff. I think Tom can handle all that. And so it's neat to like have an actor in mind while talking about these storylines. And that's what I want to do with Carnage. So once they reveal exactly who's playing Carnage and, and what their role is and what they might look like, we will get into all the Carnage stuff, I promise you. But as always, thank you for supporting this channel. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Let me know everything you think about all this in the comments below. Sorry this is a long episode, but with these trade feedbacks, I really like to dive in on these discussions and really dissect these and tell you what I like about them and what I think works on them and what I hope they take from the movie takes from these books. And, uh, and there's a lot in this one that I think they could take from, and I hope they do it. So thank you for listening to me ramble this whole time. I will see you all in the future. Peace.